Good morning, everyone. We are concluding uh, the first part of Daniel this week. Uh, we'll pick up the second part of Daniel at the end of, this, of summer. Uh, but so far, we've looked at chapter 1, when life takes a wrong turn. Chapter 2, the God of the impossible. Chapter 3, we answered the question by King Nebuchadnezzar, who is able to deliver uh, the peril of pride when King Nebuchadnezzar took credit that only belonged to God. God humbled him. Uh, dishonoring the, the God of heaven, and last week we, we talked about Belshazzar and how the Babylonian kingdom was taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire. And it happened because of this king who took the articles from the temple and he used it for their drunken revelry. And we said we are not to use holy, holy things for unholy activities. That we are not, our bodies are not only articles of the temple, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that even in the midst of messing up, the Holy Spirit never leaves us. And so we are to use our bodies to glorify God. When God says no, it's because he has a greater yes. This morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 6. And we will look at perhaps one of the top three best Sunday school stories that you hear when you're a little kid. Uh, Daniel in the lion's den. But before we do that, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we're so grateful to you for your love for us. Indeed, Lord, you are magnificent, wonderful, worthy of our praise and ad adoration. And so I pray, Father, that you would again speak to us as we look into a very familiar passage. Use it in new ways that we could apply in our lives. Uh, through the work of your Spirit, Lord, speak through me. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at another installment of Media Short Film. Hey guys. What? What? What are we gonna do with him? I mean, he's clearly getting that promotion. Yeah, did you guys hear? What? 35% of our sales went up last month because of him. What? Yeah, that's what I said. Well, I mean, the guy's pretty much perfect when it comes to working. I mean, just look at him. <laughs> what is he doing? I think he's sleeping. <laughs> you guys are dumb. The man is praying. Who prays at work? What is he doing now? Is that a booklet he's reading? Is that a sales booklet? No, that's a church booklet. Ooh, he's supposed to be working. <laughs> what church does he go to anyways? I heard he goes to FBCV. Oh, I heard they got a good looking pastor there. What? What's his name? Never mind, I don't even know. All right, guys, I got it. I know what we're going to do to get him. Why are you guys here again? We wanted to talk to you about Dan. Dan? Daniel. You guys call him Dan? Why do we start calling him Dan? OK, we don't call him Dan. But anyways, we wanted to talk to you because we all believe that Daniel's praying and whatnot is very distracting. What? How? He's my best producer. The guy prays too much. And I mean too much. He prays before he goes to work. He prays before he gets a sale. I mean, who does that? It's very distracting. Josh is Christian, and you don't see him praying that much. Right, Josh? Yeah. How often do you pray, Josh? I don't know. Before I eat? Yeah, see? So what do you want me to do? Send him downstairs to Lion's Den. No. I wouldn't send anybody down there. Lion's the most distracting worker we have. And to be honest, I don't know why we still have him. That's perfect. They can both distract each other. Yeah, I mean, would you rather have him distract three people or just one person? There it is. If this is what you really want, man, I'll do my best down here. May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you.
Daniel, right? We're gonna have so much fun, buddy. Check it out. I play basketball over there, and then I do arts and crafts over there, and then over there I do some dance moves like this. What have I done? Daniel, has the God you faithfully serve saved you? Hi, Dennis. What happened? Oh, nothing. We're just going over this church book that I have. What about work? We already did it. What? How'd you do this? I don't know. Uh, I just prayed before I make a call and whatever happens, happens. These are more cells than those three combined. You guys are going to the lines then. Stop moving. No space in here, man. I hate this place. Mm -hmm. Man, you know whose fault this is? Mm -hmm. Who? Greg. Right? Man, I, didn't, I didn't know that was gonna happen. <laughs> hey guys, I got a plan. Wait, you guys hear that? What was that? That's close in prayer. That was good. <laughs> I heard they have a good-looking pastor. Wow. <laughs> Best line ever. <laughs> Such spiritual depth and insight, those, <laughs> those guys. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful uh, this presentation by the media team. And, you know, I just want to acknowledge all the work that they've done during these past six series. I I was, I was going to be happy with two or three installment, but every single message, they came up with one. So I just want to appreciate them. Just thank the Lord for them. All right, you guys ready for a quiz? Yes? Just a cultural relevancy quiz. How many of you know what YOLO means? Huh? What does YOLO mean? Yeah, you only live once. Very good. What about FOMO? You guys know what FOMO? Ah, fear of missing out. Wow, I heard that. Very good. Now, there's one that I just heard last week, and it's FOPO. You know what FOPO is? Oh, collar. Okay. There you go. FOPO. What's FOPO? P police. <laughs> fear of people's opinion. Fear of people's opinion. And I, and I heard this uh, from David Stern, where he was saying that it's unfortunate that these basketball players, they make so much money, and yet they're unhappy. And he blamed part of it on social media. That a lot of times, our generation, when we look at social media, we don't use it simply to communicate. We use it to validate ourselves. And some of these players, they have burner accounts because they want to battle with people who are saying negative things about them. Fear of people's opinion. Now, it affects even Christians to the point where a lot of times we, we feel good or happy or sad based on what other people say about us on social media, what they say about us on Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat or any of those social media platforms. Instead of using it to communicate, we use it to validate our worth. We use it to um, 
see what what our our level of satisfaction and happiness is. Now, if we can't even handle opinions, how are we going to handle it when people outright persecute us? How are we going to handle it when people not only have bad opinions about us, how, would we, how do we handle it when people want to pull us down, tear us, tear us up, and want to see that, that we get a bad reputation and a bad name and maybe get fired from our jobs? How do we handle that? And in fact, in this, in this country, we're, pre, we're pretty much blessed because in other countries, countries like Nigeria where Christians are being killed every day, or the Middle East where people are getting beheaded, Christians are getting beheaded, uh, how do you handle that? Or I just learned last week that Brunei uh, all of a sudden instituted, or last week it, they instituted Sharia law, which means that if you're a Christian, they're going to hunt you down. How do you handle it when you're in that situation? Well, in this book that we're studying, Daniel shows us how to handle not only negative opinions, but how to handle persecutions. Now, Daniel had been serving faithfully in Babylon from the time of his youth to the time of King Belshazzar's reign. He had been serving in the, in the courts for almost 70 years or 60 years at this time. And Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon before it was taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire. And because of Daniel's character, his integrity, his skill, he was hired by the Medo-Persian Empire. And when we come to this place, once again, he shines. Once again, his character comes through. And because of that, he gets in trouble. And in this passage, we learn, what do you do when people want to pull you down? What do you do when you're persecuted because of your integrity, because of your faith, because of your love for God? In this passage, you find Daniel remaining true to his God. In fact, you know, as you know the story where he was being threatened by being thrown in the lion's den if he did not pray to the king. Notice what he, it says in verse 10. That's when Daniel knew that the document had been signed. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. This passage, Daniel shows us how to handle persecution, how to handle when people have negative opinions about you, how to handle it when people make fun of you because of your Christian faith. Three things in this passage that we want to see. First of all, you see the consistency of a godly character. You find that Daniel remained true to God, not only from Babylon to the Medo-Persian Empire, not only from his youth all the way up to his 80s. You find Daniel's character being exemplified or being acknowledged by even non-believers. Here in this passage, both the king and Daniel's enemies Acknowledge the consistency of his godly character. In verse 1, it says, It pleased Daniel, Darius, I'm sorry, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. In verse 2, And over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one. So there's 120 administrators. Over the 120 were three. We don't know if this is geographical, if they were evenly divided between Daniel and two others. To whom these satraps would give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Now, what's the implication or what's it saying? It's saying that these satraps were corrupt. That in order for the king to make sure that these guys just take in their salary and they weren't getting any kickbacks or they weren't getting anything under the table... He sets three of his most trusted officials over them, among whom Daniel excelled. So much so, in verse 3, it says, Then his, this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because of an excellent spirit was with him. So he not only excelled, notice it implies that the king discovered that this man Daniel was wise, that this wisdom which comes from God is one that Daniel demonstrated. In verse uh, the last part of that verse, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Daniel was so good that he was up for promotion. Daniel was excelled so well in what he did that the king wanted to put him over everyone. And this caused problems. 
Because the other, the other satraps and officials were jealous. Verse, oh, in, in verse 16 of chapter 6, you find that the king saw that Daniel was consistent in his character. Uh, verse 16, when he was about to throw him in the, Dan, in the uh, lion's den, he says, Whom you serve continually. May your God whom you serve continually. Uh, later on, uh, the, the following day, it says, Has your God whom you serve continually. So David, uh, Daniel was consistent, and the king recognized it. But it wasn't just the king. Daniel's enemies recon- uh, rec- recognized the consistency of his character. Verse 4 in our text. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Daniel had an impeccable record. They searched. They could find, they could find no wrongdoing. They had spies see if they could find anything, any scandal, anything that they could accuse Daniel of. And, and not an iota of negative information came through. So in verse 4, it says, Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. What's the worst thing that they could find? That he was what? Faithful to God. Not only the king, but even his enemies recognized the consistency of his character. Verse 6, Then these high official satraps came by agreement. The word agreement is ominous. It means that they conspired. They colluded. That word is is familiar to us. There was collusion in in this this passage. To the king and said to him, O king, Darius, live forever. And they flattered the king to set a trap for Daniel. It says in verse 7, All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the lions. So they lied. They said all the high officials, no, Daniel didn't agree. And the 120, a lot of them probably didn't know about this. It was just this gang of conspirators that wanted to trap Daniel so that they could get rid of him. It says, if anyone prays to anyone except to you, O king, shall be cast into the lions. Now, if you look at um, excavations of Babylon, uh, you'll see a lot of depictions of lions. You know, this is from the Ishtar Gate, and it's set on these uh, colorful uh, tiles. And uh, they, they had a fascination with lions. And if you if you did wrong in those days, one of the one of the most cruel form of execution is to throw you into the lion's den. So what did the king do? The king fell for it. Fell, fell for it. It says in verse eight. Hey, now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. And therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. Say, so, yeah, that's a good idea. But the next month, starting today, everyone should pray to me. And he signs it, signs this document. And the law of the Medes and Persians is irrevocable. Once you sign it, it's unchanged. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before this God as he had done previously. Now, why did he pray towards Jerusalem? Is this some kind of superstition? No, it is what Solomon said to the people of God as he prayed to God when he dedicated the temple. All the way back in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 30, notice what King Solomon said. And listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. What place? Jerusalem. That's what Daniel did. And listen in heaven, your dwelling place, when you hear, forgive. King Solomon said, when you get in trouble in the future, whether it is with famine or whether you have been captured into captivity, pray towards this place. And that's what he says in verse 33. When your people, Israel, are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you. And if they turn 
again to you and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house. Then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave to their fathers. This was an instruction in Solomon's prayer that when you guys get in trouble, when you're taken from this land, then pray towards this place. And that's what Daniel did. He opened his window, one of the windows that he had that faced towards Jerusalem, and he began to pray to God. What was he praying for? If you look at Daniel chapter 9, and we'll look at that a couple of months from now, this is what he prayed for. This is what he prays for every day, three times a day, from the time he was a young man to the time he's now in his mid-80s. O oh Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill. Because of our, for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now therefore, O oh our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O oh Lord, Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. He prayed for two things. He prayed that the people of God will return to Jerusalem. And he prayed that the temple that had been destroyed would be rebuilt. He didn't pray for himself. He was praying for his people. And he was praying for the glory of God to once again be restored. Because people were making fun of Israel. It says, oh Lord, for your sake, so that you are glorified. Bring your people back. And rebuild the temple. Verse 10. As he prayed towards Jerusalem. As he prayed for his people. Notice what he did. He did not neglect what? Giving thanks. He says and prayed and gave thanks before his God. As he had done previously. It's easy to give thanks when you're up for, for promotion. But do you thank God when you're about to be fired? When you're about to be laid off. It's easy to pray when you're healthy. When the doctor gives you a clean bill of health. Do you give thanks to God? When they says, oh, we found something. And you need to go for more tests. Do we give thanks to God? Because the tendency is what? When we have problems, it's not to give thanks. It's what? It's to complain. Say, Lord, why me? I've been faithful to you. Why are you doing this to me? No, what did Daniel do? He gave thanks. He gave thanks. By the way, by way of uh, <clears throat> this commercial, uh, <laughs> not this Friday, the Friday after, we will have a Good Friday service. We haven't done this in a while where we preach on the seven last words of, of Christ, so I will be doing that. And we will look at the, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated through those words or those, those sayings, a journey into the heart of Jesus. And afterwards, what we're going to do as a church is we're going to give thanks. We're going to pray together. And most of all, we're going to thank God. We're going to thank, praise and, and thank the Lord Jesus Christ for what he did on the cross. But I want us to see. And so it's called a journey into the heart of Jesus. Make sure you come at uh, 7 p.m. Okay, end of commercial. <laughs> Secondly, you see not only the consistency of a godly character, you see the challenge to a godly character. Light and darkness will always crash, will always clash. Now, whenever you live for God, Satan hates it because it glorifies God. Whenever you live for God, the world hates it. Why? Because it makes them look bad. And so in verse 11, it says, these men came by agreement. There's that word again. It occurs again and again. They, they conspired. They colluded. Came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. At this point, Daniel could have, he didn't have to pray with the window open, right? He could have just drawn the curtain. He could have play, prayed in one of the inner rooms. I mean, he could still face Jerusalem. Or he could, have, he could have stopped for a month. It's only a month. What's a month, right? I've been praying for 80 years. What's a month? Or he could have taken a vacation. Hey, King, I'm not, you know, I'm kind of feeling tired. Maybe I need R&R. &R. He could have taken a vacation for a month. But he didn't. What did he do? He prayed as, as usual with the window open. And he could have prayed silently. They didn't have to know he was praying. He could have just been out there chilling on his balcony. But he prayed loud enough for people to hear. How do we know that? Because it says they found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. And one of the things he prayed for is deliverance. Now the word petition and plea, is, it means to ask God for help. 
I like what uh, Stephen Miller says in the New American Commentary. He says, it is not, as with the three companions in chapter 3, a question of a positive sin which he will not commit, but of a positive duty which he will not omit. And so it wasn't just uh, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't want to bow down to idols. With Daniel, he didn't want to stop praying. This was his custom. This was his duty. This was his habit of every day praying three times a day to God. It was a positive duty which he will not omit. So in verse 12, when they saw it, they go, ah, we got him. We got him now. They went to the king. They couldn't wait to tell on Daniel. And they went to the king. And they tried to make Daniel look as bad as possible. But before they did that, they wanted to make sure the king signed the petition. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction? They want to make sure. That anyone who makes petition to any god or man with, within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the, into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said to the king, King, guess what? And they tried to make Daniel look as bad as possible. Daniel, this is one of the exiles from Judah. Daniel, this the slave that was taken from Judah, this one of the exiles, he says, pays no attention to you, O king. This Daniel disobeys you. This Daniel disrespects you. This Daniel doesn't care what you said. He says, and he makes his petition three times a day. In other words, king, this was not an accident. This was not an oversight. He deliberately defies you. As soon as they said that, the king understood what the plan was. In verse 14, then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed. He was in agony. He was sick to his stomach. He realized he had been tricked. He had been fooled. It says, much distress and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And so he tried to find a legal loophole. He, he, might, he might have consulted with his lawyers. Is there any way? We could set Daniel free. Is there any way that I could take back my word? Is there any way that somehow we could save my best man from dying? What happened? And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him, but he could not find a solution. Verse 15. And these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians. That no injunction or ordinance that the king established can be changed. They were bloodthirsty. They wanted Daniel's head. Verse 16. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. Unlike King Nebuchadnezzar, who was angry with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, said, make the oven seven times hotter and throw them in. King Nebuchadnezzar was angry. King Darius had a heavy heart. You could, you could tell from what he said as, they were thro- as he was throwing Daniel in. He says, the king declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And you, you could hear the anguish in his, in his voice. You know, it, he was saying, Daniel, my friend, I tried. I tried my best. But I can't save you. Now it's up to your God to save you. I mean, you could just hear the anguish in his voice. What happened to Daniel? He was thrown into the lion's den. You know, this was at night. His eyes could, can't, you know, it was really dark. There was no torches there. He, he was probably anticipating. This was his last few seconds in life. And he was anticipating any moment the, the, the lion pouncing on him and being bitten. But, but after a few seconds, after what might have seemed an eternity, nothing moved. He could hear the breathing of the lions, maybe a few growls here and there, but as, as his eyes adjusted in that den, he could see the outline of these magnificent animals, some of them sitting, some of them lying down. They were just there. They weren't moving. And so he, he realized, wow, God is keeping them from attacking me. So after a while, he probably just started walking around and go, oh, this is a nice one. 
Oh, you have a nice mane. You're a big cat. Wow. Yeah. And it was at night, so it was cold and probably got sleepy. And after a while, it goes, where could I sleep? Oh, this guy will make a nice pillow. You can just see him just putting his head down on this lion and his head bobbing slowly up and down as the lion breathed. Just sleeping peacefully. And you could hear the lion say, oh, great, this old man is lying down on me. I have to stay still the whole night now. <laughs> so he had a peaceful sleep. He was sleeping the whole night. Now, it was not so in the, king, in, in the king's palace. Notice what happened in verse 17. It says, and a stone wall. In verse 18, then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and sleep fled from him. So his journey from the lions and all the way to the palace, he must have been so sad. Saying, oh no, what's going to happen to my best man? What's going to happen to my friend Daniel? And as he got to the palace, you know, the food was brought in from the kitchen. He says, now send it back. As they sent it back, the chef was probably going, oh, what's wrong? Did he, didn't, he, he didn't like it. What's wrong with it? No, nothing wrong. He just doesn't want to eat. And then they had to go to the green room where the entertainers were, you know, stretching before their dance and vocalizing and tuning their instruments. They go home. The king doesn't want any entertainment tonight. The king goes to his bedroom and he was just pacing the whole night up and down, looking out in his balcony, going, Daniel, Daniel, what's, what's going to happen to Daniel? And then as he tries to lie down, he just, his eyes were just open. And, and so at the crack of dawn, at the very hint of, of light. This is what he does in verse 19. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. Very early in the morning, at the crack of dawn, all Babylon could hear was the, the rumbling of his chariots, of the, the kingly chariots with his, with his driver and with his bodyguards just going towards full speed, as fast as they could, towards the den. And just a smoke, of, uh, uh, a billow of, of dust behind them. Now notice in verse 19 the, what the king does. It says in verse 19, as he came near to the den where Daniel was. He didn't even wait till they got there. When he was within shouting distance, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? He didn't know what to expect. He didn't know whether he was just going to be met with silence, with a few growls of the lion, or whether Daniel had been kept alive. In this passage, we see not only the consistency and the challenge, but we see the commendation of a godly character. What happened? Inside the lion's den, Daniel hears, what's all that noise? Oh, he had a good night's sleep. Here's the king shouting. And so he wakes up, gets up, and he says in verse 21, Then the king said, Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths. And they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. I think many times when we teach this, this story in Sunday school, we focus on this. The angels shut the lion's mouths. It was a miracle. Hallelujah. But that's not the important thing in this verse. The highlight of this verse comes after because. Because I was found, what? Blameless. Daniel was innocent. He lived a life of integrity. He was innocent not only before God, he was innocent before the king. And so that was what, what was commendable about Daniel. It's not that God saved him from the lion. Because there are times that the people who are innocent die and people who are guilty live. But the, the point is that God, who sees all things, the important thing is that our lives are pleasing before God. The God who sees all things. The God who will ultimately judge. He says, we need to be innocent before him. It doesn't matter what people say. It is what God says about your life that's important. Verse 23, then the king was exceedingly glad. The moment he heard Daniel speak, oh, what, what a relief it was to him. And commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. He told his bodyguards, get him out. Get him out now. 
So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and notice what it says, and no kind of harm was found on him. Just like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, when they could, you can't even smell smoke, it says there was not a scratch on Daniel. Uh, the, the lions couldn't maul him. Their paws were kept from scratching him. He, he, was, he was unharmed. It says, and no harm was found in him. Here's the second because, and here's the second thing that is the highlight of the story. Because what? He trusted in his God. Not only was he innocent, but he trusted God. The point of Daniel is not there to be a Daniel. The point of Daniel is there to trust in the God of Daniel. He trusted God. In verse 24, and the king commanded those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives. And so, lest you think that maybe the, the lions didn't eat Daniel because they were full. Uh-uh. Notice what happens. The co-conspirators, the ring of people who wanted Daniel gone, guess what? Not only them, but their families were thrown in, and notice what happened. It says, and before they reached the bottom, they were in midair as they were going down. It says, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. As they were falling in, the, the lions were all attacking. And it served as a warning to the rest of the satraps, to the rest of the, the nation, that you are not to mess with Daniel. Verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth, the most powerful man in the world, who could not save Daniel, because he trusted in someone more powerful, acknowledge the power of Daniel's God. It says, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to no end. He delivers and rescues. That is, that is the the title of our message. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. King, with all his power, couldn't save Daniel. And at the end of it all, he acknowledged that Daniel serves one who is more powerful than me. He is the living God. The king acknowledged, my kingdom, it will end. The kingdom of Daniel's God will endure forever and ever. As you live out your Christian life, there will always be the battle of two kingdoms. God's kingdom and man's kingdom. You always have to make a choice. Which kingdom will you serve? Whose voice will you listen to? Whose command? Will you obey man's kingdom, which will end, or God's kingdom, which will endure forever and ever? Why do we do what we do? It's so that God will be glorified. There are times when God allows his, his children to be persecuted, to be martyred. Isaiah was sawn in two. James was beheaded with a sword. Peter was crucified upside down. But whether we live or die, our goal is to glorify God. In this passage, God was glorified. The best thing that we could say about Daniel is not only that was he innocent, not only did he trust God, but his life gave glory to the God that he served. Verse 28. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Now, before, when I would read this story, this would be, for me, just an addendum. I wouldn't even pay attention to it. But as I was studying for this message, something occurred to me. Something occurred to me that really is the point of the story, that is one of the, one of the principles in the story. It's that 
He reigned and prospered up to the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Who is Cyrus the Persian? Cyrus the Persian was the king who eventually allowed Israel to go back to the nation. He was the king who allowed Zerubbabel to go back with the people. He allowed Ezra to go back and rebuild the temple. So what do you see? You see that Daniel's prayer counted for something. That many times when we pray, we think, oh God, are you listening to me? And Daniel, 85 years old, has been praying every day, three times a day, for the return of the people, for the rebuilding of the, of the temple. And as, as he was praying, you know, there's a temptation to think, God, are you even listening? It's been so long. But what this passage teaches us is that prayer counts, that your prayer is heard by God. So don't ever stop praying. That when we pray, we pray to a living God and he hears us. That's why prayer meeting is important. Why? Because when we pray, the prayers are of, of a few are able to secure the blessings of many. The blessings that we receive as a church is because there are few faithful people who are praying and pleading to God. So don't, don't ever think your prayer is useless. Don't ever think that your prayer is unheard. Because we serve a living God. And so don't stop praying for people. Whenever you get in, in trouble, whenever you face trials at work, don't panic. Don't be bitter. What do you do? Pray. Don't stop praying for lost relatives. And you might say, well, Pastor, I've, I've invited them. I don't know how many Easter services I've invited them to. Keep on praying. God hears your prayers. Your prayers count. And so don't ever stop praying. What do we learn from Daniel? That his life, because it was consistent and he consistently prayed, was able to influence the very king, the very king who would allow Israel to go back to her homeland. What do we learn? That God is able to rescue and deliver. And it's important to have a consistent godly char character. The king recognized the consistency of Daniel's character. The enemies recognize the consistency of Daniel's godly character. And Daniel continued to be faithful regardless of the challenge. Don't be surprised when you're challenged. You live, you live for God and you're challenged by your coworkers, your, your, your classmates. Don't be surprised. Satan hates the fact that our godly lives glorify God. The world hates the fact that we live consistent lives. Why? Because it makes them look bad. And don't forget the commendation of a godly character. He was innocent. He trusted God. Most of all, he glorified God. I will remain true to God by trusting him in prayer during times when my faith is tested. I will remain true to God by trusting him in prayer during times when my faith is tested. You don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then the application is this. The king, as much as he loved Daniel, did not offer to go in the lion's den for Daniel. There was a limit to his love for Daniel. Our king, the Lord Jesus Christ, not only loved us, but was willing to go into the den for us. Hebrews, and this is the, the passage I want to end with, it says, But we see him for who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. We participate in, in communion, understand that Jesus our King loved us so much that he was willing to die on the cross for us. He was willing to go to the lion's den for us. Why? So that we can have eternal life, so that we could have forgiveness of sins. And if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come to him right now as we end the service. Let's pray. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed, if today you've never acknowledged Jesus 
a Savior in your life. I invite you to come to him right now. And in the quietness of this moment, just pray the simple prayer with me that acknowledges Jesus as Lord and Savior. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I hear it now. Open the door of my heart. I receive you into my life as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, I thank you for anyone who prayed that either here or those watching, Lord, on our live stream. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their, in their Christian life. If you are a believer but God is speaking to you about an area in your life that you've been compromising in or tempted to compromise, would you just right now just continue to trust God and just say, Lord, no, no matter what happens, I'm going to live for you. Lord, no matter the consequences, I'm going to remain true to you. And so if there's an area in your life that, that God is speaking to you about, will you just do business with, with him? That instead of fear of, of people's opinion, that there would be fear of God's opinion that's prevalent in your life, that will be the guiding force in your life. Because one of these days, we will all stand before him. And on that day, it's not what people think about us that matters. It is what God thinks of us. And so the quietness of this moment, if there are areas that you're tempted to compromise, and will you, will you just commit that to the Lord? Lord, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but Lord, I'm trusting you. And I know that you're able to deliver. You're able to rescue. But most of all, Lord, I want to glorify you in my decisions. Father, thank you so much for speaking to us through your word. Prepare our hearts, Lord, as we partake of communion. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.